Killer Keemstar, formerly known as DJ Keemstar, as the name suggests, has been mixing himself into a large variety of dramas and controversies since his debut on YouTube in 2009. While he truly requires no introduction, we'll give him one anyway. Keemstar is known for a lengthy list of controversies, but most prominently, he is known for his history of being a bully, doxer, false predator accuser, and a hater of Alex, just to name a few. The list of these labels is so long that it has prompted expose after expose on Keemstar. Any single one of these may have caused an inexperienced creator to leave the internet. But Keemstar, throughout it all, has persisted. Not purely fueled by money, but kept going through a combination of passion and spite. Which is a very dangerous combination. And it is why so many creators have both a hatred of Keemstar and his actions, but also a respect and understanding of them. So in a strange way, Keemstar's toxicity is what keeps him afloat for many reasons. But not now that his view counts are falling. Though that is just a surface level observation as there are many more moving parts to the machine that is Keemstar. Something that can't be fully covered within a few minutes time, which is why we'll go through the many rises and falls of Keemstar. But first, a message from this video's sponsor. Join 6 million others, including myself, by getting Atlas VPN. Upon purchasing, I personally found it nice that you can get protection on unlimited devices. So not just your PC, but also your phone. And when I say protection, I do mean protection. As Atlas both stops ads and malware and notifies you when someone is trying to steal your data. But for other uses besides protection, Atlas VPN is great for finding deals that you may be region locked to as it offers a variety of servers across the globe. And whenever I downloaded it, I found it really easy to use. I had it downloaded and working in like less than 5 minutes. And while I was messing around with the servers, I hopped on a Polish server and went to Netflix and was able to view previously region locked content not available in the US, like Rick and Morty, at an insanely fast connection speed as it offers the best and most affordable deal at $1.99 a month with 30-day money-back guarantee. So click the link in the description and help support the channel. Add over, back to the video. To get a better understanding of who Keemstar was and who he frankly still is, we'll need to understand who he was before YouTube and his job working collections at an attorney's office. To start, and to oversimplify it, someone working legal collections is typically working over the phone contacting those who owe money and haven't been making payments. At this job, you at times listen to other stories on how they accumulated their debt and whether these stories come across as idiotic or heart-wrenching matters not. The bottom line is, you need these people to pay the money that they owe, so it's not an easy job for most people. Which is why, at least the large companies of 250 plus employees have large annual turnover rates of 75 to 100 percent. But we are working with the assumption that Keemstar worked in a smaller office where the stress of such a job was more manageable. Regardless, this is a job that he started in his early 20s and retained for around 8 years. This was a job that Keemstar should have never really gotten at all because it required a college degree. But he lied during his interview and said he went to college, so he got it anyway. It was later found out that he lied, but he was so good at his job that they decided to keep him on anyway. But not only was Keemstar good at a job where he claimed you had to leave your heart at the door, he was the best at it, stating that he was the number one agent in his office. Typically, these jobs are commission-based and pay in relation to performance, so he was most likely making a large sum of money. This mixed in with his side job of DJing on weekends meant that he was earning a healthy living for himself. Enough to support a family as around 2008, he got the news that he was having a baby. Though it was ultimately celebration that spurred a chain of events that brought him to YouTube, it wasn't the celebration of the newfound parental status. It was instead the celebration of a $2,000 bonus check he received from his job. This check influenced Keemstar to take some friends out drinking, and when he returned home, he hopped on his Xbox 360 to play a match of Halo 3. As Keemstar did for enjoyment, he flung various insults at the other players in the lobby that was further drawn out into the match. 
A typical night in the life of Keemstar almost as regular as any other night. Well, that's the way it seemed at first. The following day, Keemstar began receiving messages through Xbox Live. Do you honestly think you're fucking funny? His confusion on the matter only grew when the amount of these random messages grew in size. Curious, Keemstar decided to investigate the source of these messages and about a week since that initial match, he found that someone in his lobby recorded the match and Keemstar's smack talk along with it. I feel like I'm a fucking gorilla with a fucking baseball bat fighting a retard with a spoon. This is fucking boring as hell. I'd rather fucking teabag a bear trap. Oh my god. <laughs> With the video garnering over 20,000 views, it sent Keemstar into somewhat of a panic. Enough so that he contacted this YouTuber known as Deranker to ask him to take the video down because Keemstar was fearful of losing his job over what he said online. Which provides us an interesting look into the commonalities and differences to YouTube then and now. In current YouTube, many content creators are better at presenting the best aspects of themselves online while also being careful not to expose their less favorable traits. This is common human nature, as people typically want their best selves to be represented no matter the situation. But it is intensified on YouTube. Keemstar back then was no exception in wanting the video taken down. But here's where it gets interesting. Keemstar had no knowledge that people were creating these types of YouTube videos, nor did he ever have an interest in becoming one of them. To add to this, because he was recorded without his knowledge, Keemstar was immediately a more toxic but genuine form of himself. He did not have an opportunity to expose himself to the internet as he wanted, but was thrust upon it in a more natural way. Another part that makes his beginnings unique is that he never struggled to get views or really build up an audience. But going back to wanting the video taken down, he was embarrassed about it, until Deranker convinced him that he was one of, if not the funniest trolls he met on Halo 3, and invited him to join him and other trolls in the creation of more of these types of videos where beyond smack talk, playing various different characters, or harassing female gamers, they would kill other random team members, basically doing whatever they could to get a reaction out of someone in the game and troll them. The group that Keemstar took part in was known as FAG, which stands for Federation of Asshole Gamers, who mainly posted on another channel known as Halo Funtage. Though this started as a hobby of sorts, it immediately grasped Keemstar's interests, or rather DJ Keemstar as he was known at the time. Because as Keemstar later stated, due to his childhood where he grew up on a dairy farm, there was always a part of him that wanted to avoid a life full of manual labor and had dreams of becoming an entertainer, but mostly had a primary goal of avoiding that farm life which brought him to the attorney's office. And now with this newfound opportunity, he could fulfill both aspects of his childhood dream, especially considering that Machinima, a YouTube network that partnered creators, offered him a spot as a director. To expand on this, 2009 YouTube and YouTubers had little to no expectation of making money, and their video creation hobbies were mostly fueled by passion. But when networks like Machinima started making their way through YouTube, they gained extra power by seeking out talent and contracting them by allowing ads to be placed on their content for a cut of the revenue. So creators can go from making nothing to just a little bit of money, as long as networks like Machinima took a cut when it was posted to the Machinima channel. And as luck may have it, Keemstar was one of the gaming creators to be a director on the Machinima channel with the earliest video I personally found on their channel going all the way back to July of 2009, only five months after Keemstar's debut on YouTube. As for Keemstar's channel, or channels, this part gets a bit murky because it was so long ago and there is little documentation of this time. While DJ Keemstar seems to have been his main channel established on March 12, 2008, there were many other channels that may not have been his own like Keemstar Nation, XDJ Keemstar, and DJ Keemstar for the win. Though there may have been other undiscovered channels, these seem to be the most prominent ones, with XDJ Keemstar seemingly even having a Red Bull sponsor. Though Keemstar and his group received widespread support, there was always those that doubted the legitimacy of their videos and were accused of scripting their content. 
To counter this, still in 2009, Keemstar and Friends began streaming first on Justin TV, which is now known as Twitch. A little fun fact is according to Keemstar, on his very first live stream, he got 300 concurrent viewers. But still, he further experimented and went to Ustream. Then finally, he stayed on Blog TV and created an account on December 27, 2009. Where only four days after joining, his page was the fifth most subscribed for that week. And in six months' time, he was the most subscribed person on Blog TV, surpassing other content creators like Phil DeFranco and Shay Carl. Because Keemstar, ever since his inception, was always very interactive and made his name well known through the dramas he caused and or joined in. Whether the outcome was negative or positive, usually the former, the person he interacted with would usually talk about Keemstar on their own platform which would drive curious viewers to pop in on Keemstar's livestream and further boost his views. This drama and Keem's unrelenting energy meant that he was getting on average 3,000 concurrent viewers per livestream. But this popularity is an exchange, or rather only one side of the coin. His dedication to gaming entertainment and the money it brought in allowed him to quit his $70,000 a year job at the attorney's office. But then again, it meant that Keemstar was now fully reliant on whatever it was he was doing online to support his family. But toxicity breeds toxicity. And with the numbers of enemies stacking, he ran into many roadblocks that may have deterred or even ended other content creators' careers. First, in May of 2009, Halo Fontage, FAG's collective channel, was successfully mass flagged and banned for what is assumed to be harassment, which then prompted the creation of its successor, Halo A-Holes, which was widely more successful than its predecessor for one massive reason. Beyond getting more subscribers in a month than Halo Fontage did in a year, according to Keemstar, Halo A-Holes was the fifth ever gaming channel to be partnered with YouTube. So no longer did Keem have to post on the Machinima YouTube page to make revenue, the contributors of Halo A-Holes now had their very own monetized channel, which was for several months in a row in the top 10 highest growing channels, at least in terms of subscribers, with Keemstar as the group's most recognized figure. There are many things that can be pointed at and made an example of how drastic YouTube has changed. Halo A-Holes is a great example as it's a channel purely based on what appears to be content surrounding the online trolling or harassment of others for entertainment, all while incorporating the most vulgar insults that the mind of Daniel Keem can create. But in the eyes of 2010 YouTube, this was perfect. Perfect, 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 let's monetize it. But in truth, YouTube was not a company that would be hurt much by the spread of this content. Content that mainly focused on Halo 3 and now Modern Warfare 2. While Modern Warfare 2 could be played on PlayStation or Xbox, Halo was solely a Microsoft IP, and with Microsoft wanting to ship its online multiplayer experience as friendly and expand further into the growing consumer base that sought online gaming, it had to reshape and crack down on the negative, toxic reputation that online gaming was getting. And what a better way to staunch the flow of hate than to go after the biggest figures perpetuating it, like DJ Keemstar. As fans were quick to notice, he was banned from Xbox Live. I'm literally being harassed. I'm recording all this. I'm fucking, I'm going to fucking work. I'm not a little fucking kid. I'm an adult. I'm an adult that knows a lot of fucking people. And I'm fucking suing and I'm making everything public. Everything public. Everyone's going to know step by step what has been happening to me. You know what I think it is? I think they're mad. I think the enforcement team's a little mad because I stuck up for myself because they have a system in place that allowed my account to get shut down. I kept getting my accounts locked, so they weren't fixing my problem. So I upload a video and tell people, look, if they're not going to fix my problem, then make the problem worse until they do fix it. All right? What are you guys, butthurt enforcement team? Because of your policies? I'm the fucking victim here. While the logical response for someone in Keemstar's field to be able to continue to do what he was doing would be to make another account and continue trolling, it wasn't that simple. As whenever you are banned from Xbox Live, not only does it strike your gamer tag, but also your entire Xbox. So to get back into trolling, Keemstar would need to purchase an entirely new Xbox, which is what he did. And that one got banned, so he bought another, and another, as they kept on getting banned. But Keemstar did not hold on to these consoles. He returned them, stating that they didn't work. 
which to some extent was the truth. And to avoid suspicion amongst the retailers he was returning these consoles to, he alternated stores to continue essentially borrowing Xboxes from them. But even this proved too much to maintain, as Keemstar was usually allotted about one hour of stream time before what was deemed to be a moderator working on Microsoft to skim Block TV for any rule-breaking content banned his account, leaving Keemstar without gameplay for the rest of the livestream. Again, luckily for Keemstar, there was a perfect alternative that suited his style of entertainment, and that was Battlecam. A live streaming website launched in March of 2010 where two streamers were pitted against each other and whoever formulated the best insults and won the audience's favor was voted up by them, while the loser was voted down and had to regain their position in the roster by frankly performing better, with the ultimate objective to appear at the top of the website and defend your position. But Keemstar had a very, very large advantage, and that was he was already established. So what he did to dominate the website was begin streaming on Battlecam, something anyone can do, but he was also streaming on Block TV at the same time, and had his audience on Block TV go to Battlecam and continually vote him up. So whenever Keemstar pleased, he could be at the top of this website. Though this could be seen as an unfair advantage, and even grounds for termination on Battlecam for some, for the owner of the website, eccentric billionaire Alki David, it was just some extra promotion. So him and Keemstar became friends very quickly, solidified by Keemstar's new moderator status on Battlecam. And with this power, one could liberally put channels on a lower position or put them in the front of the line, which is known as starting someone. So one night, Keemstar hopped on Battlecam and was started, so he appeared in the front of the line which made him seem like he was abusing his mod powers. But he quickly deduced who was starting him via the chat members flinging various Italian-based racial slurs towards him. These messages also included the name of another moderator known as Alex. If it isn't obvious already, this led to arguably the most infamous clip on Keemstar on the internet because while frustrated, he won on Block TV to prove he wasn't abusing his moderator powers by showing he wasn't touching the keyboard and putting his hands up, and also called Alex that one racial slur that trumps all others, while also encouraging his viewers to repeat it in the chat. I'm okay, fuck this, I'm on Block TV with my fucking hands up, I'm not starting my fucking self. You fucking stupid bitch! This stupid fucking justice, all oh, fucking righteous fucking. <laughs> Alex is doing this shit. You fucking. <laughs> I swear to fucking God, I'm gonna find out. Yo, everybody, type in the chat. Alex is a stupid. <laughs> Just type in the chat. Alex is a stupid. <laughs> fucking. At first, this clip was well received as an effective attack on Alex, but as the internet changed, so did the people's perspectives on it. But that's not until much later. Fuck the Fans was an equally controversial clip making its rounds through 2010 YouTube that also shined a not so favorable light on Keemstar. I think it's funny. I've been laughing for the last hour that your mom died of cancer. I don't give a fuck about any of you. I am in this for your money and your money only. That's all I care about. All right. I only do this show for money, that's it, alright? I don't do it to entertain people, that's just a fucking scam. Uh, I don't give a fuck about any of you. I really hope you die of cancer. I hate every single one of you. Fuck the fans. No sarcasm, no joking. Fuck the fans. Thank you. I see there's a lot of debate, you know, is he joking, is he being sarcastic, or whatever. Of course I'm joking. You know what I mean? Like, cancer is a horrible thing. But it's not horrible enough. What I really mean is I hope you get cancer, and I hope you fucking live the last fucking month of your life every single day, gasping for a breath of air and living with the worst horrible fucking pain of your life. For the last fucking time. Fuck the... Fans. There are a few things that make Keemstar's frustration a bit more understandable in this situation. With the popularity of Keemstar's trolling content, as seen by the over 600 concurrent viewers on his livestream, 
Fans would join his game and effectively ruin his trolling as they were in on the joke. Keemstar also later states that this was a character called Evil Keemstar, where he talks down to the fans who he states were in on the joke. But this is most likely a farce, as he still says in the clip, no joking, no sarcasm, fuck the fans. This theory is reinforced by a lesser known follow-up clip where Keemstar addresses his outburst. I'll just sit in front of this computer, but I do spend a lot of time on this show and it's ruined. So I'm really sorry I said all that shit, but I almost mean it. I almost wish that uh, you can all... That's it. So why would Keemstar be sorry if the viewers knew he was joking? He seemingly also made a channel two days later called Fuck the Fans, serving the purpose of opening fan mail. So whether you believe it was an annoyed Keemstar improperly remembering this event, or that he was actually playing a character and did not mean the things that he said is up to you. The point of focusing on a rant with seemingly little significance is that it'll later be mentioned in the video. And this also highlights another difficulty in continuing his traditional trolling content. Not only were his fans session joining his game and ruining his content while he was getting his Xbox accounts perpetually banned, his YouTube channels were also under attack. It was time for a change. If he wanted to continue to succeed, he needed something else. Something bigger. And that opportunity came with the pre-release of a small indie game known as Minecraft. Before Minecraft sparked a change of Let's Play culture and effectively launched hundreds of YouTubers' careers, it was a PC-exclusive game where those with consoles as their primary gaming system could only hope to have it available to them one day, and had to experience it through exponentially increasing videos covering it on YouTube. And with any given format, genre, or artist's success, there will always be clones to fill in the demands where the original failed too. An example of this was Fortresscraft a Minecraft-esque game in development that was to be released on Xbox 360. But what it lacked was promotion, which is where Keemstar came in. He knew that there was a demand that needed to be met, and that he could act as the propelling marketing force to sell this game, to which he contacted the developers and offered to promote their game for ownership of half of their company, which the developers declined. That's when Keemstar offered them a 24-hour period of promotion to show the effectiveness of his influence and uploaded a Fortress Craft trailer on his Halo Ailes channel that got a little over 72,000 views in a week's time. And through his Twitter, he was able to get other gaming platforms to cover it as well. The developer was so impressed at Keemstar's performance, he offered him 30% of Fortress Craft for continued promotion, which Keemstar agreed to. Notch took another game and ripped it off and made Minecraft. Talk shit about my fucking game, Fortress Craft? Saying that's a ripoff and that, that Fortress Craft could go suck a fucking dick? The end result was Fortress Craft selling an estimated 2 million copies. So it's safe to say that Keemstar made over a million dollars from this deal. This was money that he needed desperately after a massive drop in revenue because he was unable to continue his trolling content. The problem was that Microsoft pays quarterly, which meant that he was anticipating a check in June while in March. So in two months, this got all the more serious when the developer of Fortress Craft failed to fill out the paperwork in time, which meant that Keemstar's life-changing money was delayed by another couple months. But Keemstar still kept active and found other ventures to keep him busy in the meantime. That's where Alki David and the Billionaire's Challenge comes in. A what was announced to be pay-per-view event that pitted several Call of Duty YouTubers against each other to raise money for charity. An event that was helped put together by Keemstar that started in mid-2011, which at its peak got an alleged 100,000 concurrent viewers. The high turnout does not translate to the event being a complete success, as the technical quality and the general organization left a general air of awkwardness throughout the production, which as you'd expect for a first-time production like this. But the next one substantially improved on this, though it was controversial for its own reasons. Still, it provided Keemstar with more experience and networking opportunities. Though he didn't make more friends, he did not make the money which he desperately needed, as he was now struggling financially to the point where he and his family were being threatened with an eviction from their apartment. It was so bad that he was in talks with his previous job at the attorney's office to come back. But that's when another opportunity was presented at him at just the right moment. 
An owner of a YouTube network contacted Akeem and offered him a deal similar to the one he made with the developers of Fortresscraft, and that was, you promote our network and we'll give you 50% of the revenue. They would even call it the Keemstar network. On the surface, it sounds like a great deal, but when you get into the terms of how they wanted it promoted, it gets a bit suspicious. This network offered to partner anyone and showcase their videos on their channel so long as they got a $50 deposit as insurance to deter any trolls, or so they say. But Keemstar needing the money and riding on the high of his success with Fortresscraft gladly accepted and began promoting this network and immediately got around 50 people to enlist. But also, just as fast, got an email from GameStation that sent Keemstar into a panic. GameStation, later known as Maker, is the network that partnered his main channel, Halo Aholes. But that was no longer the case, as they stated that Keem taking these deposits broke YouTube's terms of service, and Keem's channel was no longer partnered. To attempt to fix the situation, Keem immediately deleted the video, but by then it was too late. It didn't take long for Keem's channel to be banned, and for his reputation to sink along with it. With little to no way to make amends for a variety of reasons, finally hit a Keemstar when he found out that the guy he was in talks with about the Keemstar network actually purchased the hacked multi-channel network through illegal means. If it wasn't before, it was now more than ever apparent that it was a complete scam that Keemstar fell for. To make matters worse, this person was also in charge of the PayPal Keem's viewers were throwing money into. So try as he might, Keem wouldn't be able to refund those who put money into the scam as he did not have the transaction history. And because Keem already soured his reputation as a troll, it made it hard to believe that he wasn't in on the scheme. So now not only was he still struggling financially, he lost one of his few sources of revenue. Beyond that, he lost a channel that he was working on building for over a year now, and all he could do at this point was wait for the Fortresscraft money to come in, sustaining himself through money he recently borrowed from his parents. But shortly after this loss, he gained a lot. The Fortresscraft money had finally come in. So seemingly overnight, Keem went from pinching pennies and nearly getting evicted to becoming a millionaire. This spurred a spree of new purchases like a new house and a new car that he paid for in cash, and began finding ways to invest his money. But even then, with all these new toys and more money that he knew what to do with, there was still a lingering feeling of defeat and the loss that came from it. Not necessarily in the sense of losing, but more so as he was unaware what to do with his life. So as Keemstar does, he found purpose and began planning a new endeavor. One that required a sort of partner to help him with the workload, and the most important part, the entertainment. He never found him, but he did find only Use Me Blade, a Call of Duty commentary channel with around half a million subscribers at the time who was quite influential in his own right. Keem had a personal interest in him because while he was from the game community like Keem, his commentaries, through Keem's eyes, had thought-provoking topics outside of talking about his day or the gameplay on screen as you'd expect from a typical Call of Duty commentator. This project was a podcast, so thrown into the mix of shaping this podcast was Keem's recent addiction to Painkiller Already, a popular gaming podcast that while it is gaming-themed, discussed a variety of topics. This gave us a bit of insight into how he envisioned his podcast and, in a sense, the future of his presence online. And after much pestering, Keemstar convinced Blade to co-host a new podcast with him. While Keemstar did all the editing and channel management, their split of the earnings was still 50-50 as that is what it took to get Blade on board. So on June 27, 2012, the Bad Kids Show YouTube channel was established and took a little over a week to get up to nearly 10,000 subscribers, mainly through promotion. As though Keem's previous main channel, Halo Aholes, was banned for promoting a scam, he still had many other channels to advertise with. And just like PKA, Painkiller Already, the Bad Kids show was a success. And to go back on PKA's influence on the show and Keemstar, what Keem seemed to be inching to more and more was entertainment based largely around personality, more so than the content, and also a way to create a fluid audience. One that would not just follow Keemstar for his trolling content or his combativeness on Battlecam, but rather to follow him as a person. This is what the Bad Kids show was. It was not only focused on gaming, but also to get a different, not always aggressive side of Keemstar's personality out there. And with Blade being a relaxed character, in contrast to Keem's aggression, but similar in his interests, made Blade a great host for the podcast. 
But Keem still wanted more out of it, and he finally found out what that something more was when he flew out Blade and fell YouTube and high school friend, Scott Ken Martin, as a cameraman to record the most memorable of Keemstar's songs, Dollar in the Woods, that include popular lines such as, Walk in the woods, found a dollar, found a, found a dollar, walk in the woods. While they were all centralized at one location, Keemstar with season tickets to the Bills game took the opportunity to film a podcast while tailgating. While this episode performed just as well as any other, Blade and Keemstar saw more to it. This episode to them was potential. That's when Blade pitched the idea to continue this in-person format to improve the quality and develop an online reality TV show feeling to it. Yesterday, when we went to Six Flags and we went around, went on different rides, you know, maybe interviewed some people that want to be interviewed, and just posted up whenever we felt the need to post up and just, just talk and do whatever, I think that that would be amazing if we could do that every episode. Here's the thing. All right, you know I've been dumping a lot of money in this project. Yeah, and Keemstar, honestly, like, Keemstar's been dumping money into this. Like, everything that's having to do with... But the reason, show. the reason why I dump money in it is because I believe in it. Here's the thing. We need to somehow make this profitable. Yeah. Oh, wait, 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 I shouldn't even say profitable. I just want to cover the cost. Sustainable. Sustainable, I'm yeah. set for life with the things I'm doing. With Keem gladly accepting, and during PAX West in Seattle, which was conveniently where Blade was located, they packed up Blade's belongings and drove from Seattle to Keem's home city of Buffalo. There, they began producing more podcast episodes. But just like many of Keem's previous projects, his past caught up to him and derailed his would-be future plans on YouTube. As for how, that could be explained by a quick look at the Bad Kid Show channel. Well, that be if it was still available. As less than a month after recording the Tailgate podcast episode and committing further to the development of his channel, it was already banned. As per YouTube's rules that you're not allowed to ban evade or circumvent a ban by creating an alternate channel. But Keemstar already having several other channels banned did what he's always done, and that was ban evade some more, this time creating the Bad Kids Show podcast channel not to be confused with the now banned Bad Kids Show. Though this channel still hosted old and new podcast episodes, it branched out a bit in a form of live streams that were truly only brought on through Keemstar's new hobby, Hashtag DramaAlert, where he discussed the various dramas happening mostly in the Call of Duty community. Initially, this was mostly done as a joke, but that changed when Keemstar started shoutcasting some concerning tweets that the then famous, but now infamous, content creator Wings of Redemption was putting out. And while doing so, Wings and many others requested to join the call and did so, bringing the drama from Twitter to a livestream format that was left up as a video for the fans of the Bad Kids podcast to view. Um, Twitter level, yo. <laughs> so, you know, if you guys follow me on Twitter, you know that I'm always on top of all the drama that goes on between commentators and all that. And I do this series on Twitter called uh, Drama Alerts, brought to you by DJ Keemstar. Um, this is where it gets good. He says, I've got a load of guns, El Presador, and if I decide to kill myself, I'm taking you with me. You see that? I'm reading, I'm reading this to make sure. Could that be, is, is that really what he said? Like, could that be like, Ms. No, that's the exact same one that he, that, uh, that's the real one. That's the real one, because that's when El Prezor tweeted it. It's the same exact picture. Wings, you know you can't say that. You can't even, like, think that out loud. You can't even, like, say that shit by yourself in the bathroom. That's some... That's in just insane. Absolutely insane. Uh, Wings wants in. Wings is saying that he wants... If you're just tuning in, we have uh, Wings of Redemption. We have um, Woody here. We have Only Use Me Play, DJ Keemstar, Scott Kimmer. And on the phone on Skype, we have White Boy 7th Street and uh, Duranker. And uh, we're just basically uh, speaking about some big drama that's been going on on Twitter tonight. Now, El Presador is saying to Wings that he's turning you in to the FBI Wings for a threat <laughs> on his family. What are your thoughts on that? My thoughts, no are, my thoughts are what Woody's doing is laughing. However, what Keemstar did not anticipate was the high rates of traffic towards this drama-laden video which we can estimate by the number of likes, passed well over 100,000 views within a few days of it being streamed. 
Wasting no time, Keem and Blade did another similar stream the following day, going under the same format of hashtag drama alert. These activities were also inspired by the 2012 American TV series Newsroom, where a news anchor breaks his unopinionated mold and inserts his rationality into the stories being shown, which was how Keemstar was formatting his drama alert tweets on Twitter. But now, with his discovery of this new successful format, he decided it was time to dedicate a channel to it. And luckily, he still had a few to spare, so he settled on XDJ Keemstar, a channel created back in 2009 to host the very first sub 5 minute drama alert episode. But this channel was shared with his typical giveaways to boost channel growth and video game related content. It wasn't until about two months later that he fully dedicated this channel to this new content style and even changed the name to hashtag drama alert nation. With this, he unofficially dedicated himself to daily uploads that got on average 15,000 views. That's not bad considering he was still restricting himself to covering drama exclusively in the gaming community. Also, while these uploads were short and fast, they competed with his podcast. And while this channel's attention was fully directed towards drama alert videos, the history of it muddied the waters and didn't completely set a straight tone for what content one would expect from this channel. Sure, it was recently changed to these new drama alert gaming videos, but previously it had many opinionated videos covering a variety of topics, and without a strong, prominent content style, it could be difficult to accumulate viewers on any given channel. Which beyond getting his channels repeatedly banned is the reason he had so many of them. They were for experimentation. A sort of Darwinism approach to content creation that the most successful creators follow where the viewers guide their content style. And for that reason, on December 19, 2012, the Drama Alert Nation YouTube channel was established to host nothing but drama alerts from the get-go. What's up, Drama Alert Nation? I'm your host, DJ Keemstar. Let's get right into the news. Today's story is about Green Goblin. Immediately, this channel's video started outperforming any other content style that Keem has ever produced. With his daily Drama Alert videos averaging 30,000 views in two weeks' time, he was already at half a million total views on his channel with a total of 24,000 subscribers. He also expanded this operation to a dedicated Twitter and Reddit. And with the start of 2013, with a new year, Keemstar made a new channel for both Drama Alert and the Bad Kids podcast, but not by choice, as he'd find out that someone was mass reporting his channels and again got them banned. From Drama Alert to his personal channels that were primarily used to archive videos of his family, all because of his ban of Halo a-holes that promoted a scam over a year ago. But this new Drama Alert channel grew even faster. It allegedly got 10,000 subscribers in two days' time, but it was immediately banned. Unlike before, where Keemstar's channels at least took a few months to get banned, they were now getting struck immediately. So he couldn't rely on his previous ban evasion tactics of creating new channels, as to do so would mean he would have to create several new channels a month just to operate on YouTube. If Keem really wanted to reach his sought potential, he knew this was an issue that had to be solved in an official capacity. So Keemstar built another team of people to try to get Halo a-holes unbanned, and after several months of trying and four drama alert channels hitting 100,000 subscribers and getting banned, his team was finally able to make some progress with YouTube and have Halo a-holes unbanned, as they were able to convince YouTube of Keemstar's ignorance of the scam. So during April of 2013, with this nostalgic freedom being reobtained, Keemstar revitalized many of his former projects through his new channels. Like the Bad Kid Cast channel for his podcast, the Drama Alert channel for his news stories, and even got back into trolling with the creation of the channel Killer Keemstar. Beyond his personal channels, Keem also focused on various other projects that he knew could bring him a large sum of money like his establishment of an esports team and his promotion of Amputee from the developers of Fortresscraft. Amputee is a game where you make tea. Though it sounds simple, the challenge is similar to the Flash games such as Quop, where all you need to do is run. The true objective in these games is to master the complicated controls to perform a simple task and seeing larger content creators fail over and over at something that looks comically simple makes for an entertaining video and therefore creates more promotion. 
Enough so that large content creators like PewDiePie played it and introduced it to millions, therefore helping line Keemstar's pockets. But what seemed to be a war long won by Keemstar made very clear it wasn't during March of 2014, as there was another wave of bans. Though his channel, Halo A-Holes, was restored, the many other channels that were banned by proxy of it being originally banned were not. So an unidentified party reported Keemstar's other banned channels and through a paradoxical twist of events, Keemstar's channels were banned. So to explain it in a poor and complex manner, Keemstar's new channels were banned because his other channels that got banned through his association of Halo A-Holes were still banned. But Halo A-Holes was unbanned so now it was the reverse headed by the consistently inconsistent mess that makes up YouTube headquarters. But it's no secret that Keemstar still exists on the platform today, and his next channel would be the final and current one that you can find on YouTube right now, and that's due to Freedom, the YouTube network that Keem partnered with. In collaboration, they were able to find a simple loophole in his ban, and that was while Keemstar is banned from owning a channel and practically managing it in any way, he was not banned from appearing in a video. So for that reason, he made a friend make the final Drama Alert channel on June 6, 2014, which was almost immediately banned. That's when his network stepped in and wrote YouTube a lengthy email and had his channel returned to him in about two days' time. The reason that the time is significant is because when he wasn't partnered, it took months to over a year to get anywhere with YouTube. The new drama alert, which is literally what the channel is called as seen by the URL, practically took off where the previous banned drama alert channel left off, with Keem now getting on average 100,000 views per video. Still focused on drama mostly centered around the gaming community was having massive success with his seemingly largest problem solved. And yes, it is true that Keemstar found his optimal form of content, but with any content style, there is always room for small optimizations that can improve the content largely. And this difference can be seen between 2014 and 2015 Drama Alert. To paint a picture of 2014 Drama Alert, Keemstar was building a small team to help run the show, which mostly helped gather information and research potential stories. This help came in the form of fans asking if they could be part of the team. And because it was such a common occurrence, Keem opted accepted their help as a test to view how well they performed. Most of the people he brought on, by Keemstar standards, did a very poor job. But there were a few diamonds in the rough that did such a phenomenal job that Keem brought them on as paid employees. Beyond having extra help, it was important to vet these people as their research and the stories they brought to Keem needed to be extremely accurate or Keem could potentially face the backlash of slandering someone. Only made worse if the false information and or accusation is severe. Anyhow, many of Keem's stories in 2014, while moderately entertaining, lacked much focus, energy, and contextual information that would bring viewers to his channel later on. And while the main focus was gaming entertainment, it also branched out to other stories ranging from strangers arguing politics on Facebook to random content creators' dramas and updates. But Keem's main meat in most videos relied on reading tweets of people arguing back and forth on Twitter, with many of these stories lacking much impact at all. And Pro Syndicate said that Ali A sucks at Minecraft. As to say that though Keemstar could pull much drama from these people in the gaming community, their main form of content was relatively drama free, so many days there wasn't much crazy or wild news that could pull a large amount of viewers. But if he could milk an ongoing story and stretch it out through several videos, it could garner much viewership. This is exemplified through his coverage of Lizard Squad. The hackers who ruined Christmas. This is the group responsible for hacking two of the biggest computing companies in the world. The hacking group that, among many other things, took down the PlayStation Network and Xbox Live. And those curious on why they couldn't play online might search YouTube for an answer, and what they'd find is Keemstar interviewing a member of the group with them explaining all the services they took down and will continue to hack. And they did. Both Xbox Live and PlayStation Network were taken down several times in the last two months of 2014. As a result, Keemstar covered them about 21 times in that time period by conducting further interviews, releasing news on their hacked targets, covering Finest Group, which is another hacking group that opposed Lizard Squad, and for a moment, Keem also got hacked by Lizard Squad themselves. 
This constant coverage and also extraction of information via interviews made this a successful long-running story on Kim's channel, reflected by the hundreds of thousands of views he got on videos by the end of the year. This helps mark our transition to 2015 both with a new year and a refocusing in content style. As the year progressed, Keemstar focused less and less intensely on the Call of Duty community, most likely due to the fact that when he did, the videos usually did not get as much traction as a video focusing on intense content creator drama. This is shown clearly by the three videos uploaded back to back covering Call of Duty Champs which was a million dollar prize championship held back in 2015. These are some if not the least viewed videos for that year. Also, they were uploaded at the tail end of March, which interestingly enough, his possibly most viewed videos for 2015 were uploaded less than a month later. These would undoubtedly change Drama Alert forever as they uncovered a very dramatic and hot topic. But they also brought much negative attention towards Keemstar for reporting it in what some might consider a highly deceptive and dishonest matter. But before we get into that, we must cover what these videos even are and the origin of them. To start, these practically all began from this now deleted Reddit post that can be reviewed through websites that archive such things. What the poster claims is that Badgerverse, a Minecraft content creator on the rise, was arrested in 2004 for unlawful transactions with a minor. The source, BustedMugshots.com. As Keem usually does when he's given such damning information, he contacted the other party, Badgerverse, about these accusations before going public with them. But he was not the only one, as this was seemingly making the rounds through the internet. And after denying these accusations when questioned by Keem, Basher tried to step in front of the story by uploading a 46 minute long video recounting his life story and the arrest that happened back in 2004. He alleges that he was friendly with his friend's sister that was 15 years old at the time and their parents got suspicious about Basher who was, as Basher claims, 18 at the time and their parents got a bit suspicious about him. Basher, who claims he was 18 at the time, was exchanging sexually charged messages with her. When the parents of the 15 year old found out, it led to a series of events where he was charged with, as seen from BustedMugshots.com, an unlawful transaction with a minor. Throughout the story, Basher's emotional and seemingly genuine recounting of the story got him much support. But there were those that were dissatisfied with his story, namely Keemstar, who at this point was on the offense against Basher and constantly poked at him through Twitter and an April Fool's drama alert that showcased a fake tweet that made him seem guilty of S.A. That's when Basher contacted Machinima to see if they could get Keem's video taken down. But Basher's defensiveness, not just against Keem, but practically anyone that may construe Basher's story worse than he retold it in his 46 minute long video, just made Keem more and more aggressive. And though there were lingering threats of a lawsuit, Keem kept prodding at Basher's weakness and finally got the reaction he wanted. After all, without Keemstar, he most likely would not have gotten to this point and Keem wouldn't have squeezed a story out of him. Hey guys, it's me. Uh... I'm done. Like, I'm so freaking tired of it. I'm like, going absolutely freaking mad. I'm... I didn't expect to freaking get this big. And I didn't expect, like, my past and everything to get all out there. And Keemstar just keeps freaking... It's just constant barrage. Like, all my videos are like... I've been up for so long and I'm so stressed right now and it's just... I'm done. Fuck! Fuck you! Fuck you! I hate you all! Who are attacking me constantly! Being that Keem was mentioned, within 30 seconds of the start of the video, it was immediately forwarded to him where he watched it live. I didn't expect to freaking get this big. And I didn't expect, like, my past and everything. To get oh all up there. And Keemstar just keeps freaking. It's just constant barrage. Like, all my videos are like. I've been up for so long and I'm so stressed right now. And oh it's God, just, he's coming for me, dude. I'm done. I can't do Holy it shit. Say that I pushed him too far, but I didn't. I didn't. He's just. This is more playing the victim. This is more like. 
manipulation. That's all I see is manipulation. Like, all I, all I wanted, and all I think anybody wanted, was this dude to just own up to what happened and move on. Oh, no! ah! Dude, I'm scared. I'm fucking scared. Dude, like, get the fuck away, dude. Like, what the fuck, dude? I'm fucking scared, bro. Like, what the fuck? Jesus Christ, I feel like he's fucking coming for me, bro. <laughs> I'm fucking scared, dude. Like, I feel like this dude's gonna try to- Citing that he is fearful for his life, but it's difficult to differentiate that from an excitement as he just became a major player in a drama that was about to trend through the online community. So on the same day, Keem made a response to Basher's video. A video that Basher privated it almost immediately. He's never going to be the victim. He's always going to be the bad guy. And the fact that he can just manipulate so many people so easy, it scares the living shit out of me. It scares the living shit out of me. It scares me that other YouTubers are afraid to voice their opinion on this subject. It scares me that this guy is that good at manipulating people. It scares me. To summarize Keem's 18 minute long video, it has him saying that Basher kept playing the victim card, when in reality, people should be focusing on how that 15 year old was the victim. And that throughout Basher's life story, some ages don't make sense, as Basher says he was 18 when this happened, but in reality, he was most likely 20 due to a news clipping that Basher tweeted out. To add more, Basher's current girlfriend, who was a fan of his, met him while he was in his late 20s and she was 17. So there are four key things Keem kept hammering in this video. The inconsistencies with age, which he labeled as Basher being deceptive rather than accidentally inaccurate as most people are with dates, even Keemstar. Next is claiming that this video was done through a manipulative perspective and that he believes that the entire video should have been an apology rather than a short segment in it. Hence why Keem keeps saying that Basher is playing the victim card. And beyond retaliating by wanting to take Keemstar's April Fool video down, Keemstar had many grievances with Basher because Keem is a parent himself and could not imagine his daughter in such an undesirable situation. Overall citing Basher to be a massive manipulator and monster in the YouTube community that people should be cautious of. This video performed extremely well but not as well as his next one that was also covering Basher, citing that fans of both audiences were angry and that there was still no clear understanding of whether Basher was lying about his past. It's my now, I'm getting a lot of hate from Basher fans, and Basher is getting a lot of hate from people in the community over this situation. And we still don't know 100% the truth. And let me interview you. Let's put this thing to rest. Let's get the final chapter in this story done and over with. And let's turn all this hate and all this negativity into something incredibly positive. Just a simple yes or no. Do you want to help out these kids? Do you want to help raise $5,000 for this charity, Gamers Outreach? So Keemstar extended an interview invitation to Basher for charity, with Keemstar saying that he wanted to put this all to rest. But it's apparent, at least through the many follow-up videos that performed insanely well, that Keemstar was going to latch onto this story so long as people kept returning to his channel for it. While we won't go in-depth into all these, I will heavily recommend the Gamer From Mars video, The Bash vs. Conspiracy, full documentary that dissects this situation. What we will dive into is how and why this worked so well for Keemstar. First is that Keemstar is inherently a troll. That's how he got started on the platform and that's basically been his personality ever since. Trolling is usually done to get a reaction out of someone through whatever means necessary. Whether that means throwing out various, unconfirmable rumors, or in this situation, interviewing other ex-fans of Basher that were coming out on his alleged illicit messages, allowing Keem to continue to cover this ever-expanding story. If this were a collaboration, which in a way it was, Basher was sitting at around 1.7 million subscribers, and Keemstar was sitting at around 300,000. So Keemstar must have known that every time Basher complained about him or mentioned him in any capacity, it would bring more and more people to Keemstar's channel and even more in-depth coverage of Basher's past. So Keem had much to gain by continuing this. 
So that's why, in more ways than one, this was a collaboration. A non-friendly one, until it was. When 10 days later, Keemstar managed to get an interview with Basher, starting it off by Keem stating that he and the Drama Alert team verified that when Basher committed that crime way back when, the ages were 18 and 15 and not the rumored 20 and 13. As for Basher, he claims that he never talked to underage girls willingly, and if he did, he did not know about their age. I can imagine. Basically, the Drama Alert team did more research into what happened with Basher 11 years ago, and we can now confirm that the ages were 18 and 15, not 20 and 13. I don't go out of my way to talk to underage girls. I just don't do that. If I talk to an underage girl, I did not know their age. Either they lied about it or it just didn't even get mentioned, and I'm flirting. Your friends disown you, and then your girlfriend, who you love, and you thought that she loved you. Oh, God, I love her, dude. Disowns you, have you no idea. for her career. That made I, me feel sorry for you. That yeah. legitimately made me feel sorry for you. Man, I don't like this stuff that happened between you and these younger girls. And I think that... That's why I apologized. I don't either. I, I don't think you can ever do anything like this. Enough people know about this situation where you won't do anything like this, right? I think no. that the punishment of you being through the runner in this whole community uh, is enough for what you did. And I don't think that... You need to still be kicked while you're down. Many others refute these claims by stating that they stated their age when talking to him. So someone in this situation is lying. Which is why it's important to mention that Basher also admits that he's a pathological liar and many acquaintances both now and several years back have confirmed that Basher is in fact a known liar. Came out. Uh, some of us earlier than others had figured out he was full of shit with the, being an engineer for NVIDIA and then working for Pixar. None of us knew about the pedophilia. But since this video is focusing on Keemstar, we'll readjust to him and the reason why this change in heart happened. Let's discuss the benefits. The harassment and rumors Keemstar spread around helped gain the attention of not just Basher's audience, but also those tuning into Basher's freakout video and the drama following it. Through this, Keemstar was getting much hate through Basher's large following. It is, after all, easier to get someone's attention from stating something negative than something positive, as it's conflict and controversy that makes most stories compelling. But now that he changed stances, though not everyone was convinced, he gained the support of most of Basher's extremely large following that once hated him. So through it all, he was able to make things work almost completely in his favor. Almost. And that's because of possibly his most viewed video of 2015, a video of him interviewing Basher that was joined in by Basher's associate and apparent Minecraft server owner, Smile for YouTube. In this interview, Smile claims to have audio proving that Basher's ex-girlfriend is a gold digger, and that was the reason she stayed with him. With Basher's obsession with this woman, the grand reveal of this leaked Skype call and Basher's outburst from it... A message from her today saying that she loves me, though. I... Just straight up. I told her... Um, I told her I'm going to pay her $1,000 if she did say that to you. If I, I, I convinced her basically that I'll give her $1,000 if she did say that to you. We bullshit. wanted to find out if she was a gold digger. Bullshit. So this is bullshit. Bullshit. I, I had to do it, man. I had to prove it so the whole world can see what the real true colors are. Smile here, okay? for YouTube. Yes. Oh, Play bullshit. the audio. Here it is. You have actual audio? Here it is. Hey. No, I know. Hey, what's up? Okay, not too much. Okay, he is going to... He, he's losing his fucking mind right now. He's bawling his fucking eyes out. He said that he will do it, but he needs to hear you say something to him. You have to talk, talk to him nice or something like that, because he's bawling his eyes out. I'll give you $1,000 to bullshit your way through this. I'll give you $1,000 right now. Bullshit your way through this. I already this. tried calling him. He's not picking up. Okay. I literally... I left him a Okay, if I... You used me! You got fucking caught! I don't care anymore! This is bullshit! <gasps> I don't give a fuck. I don't fucking care. At least in the end, I got the fucker in the ass. Beyond it being an entertaining video, it helped move much of the hate from Basher to his ex-girlfriend and gave Keemstar new levels of notoriety in the YouTube community. Basher was on later episodes of Drama Alert, but it never rekindled the flame of this drama. 
On the topic of fire, it should be noted that Keemstar regularly takes risks and or plays with fire. That usually works in his favor, but also regularly gets burned. And this was one of those situations, as on the surface, this entire drama is already confusing enough. But when further looked into, it becomes quite a jumbled mess, with several parties working for their own gains and practically only Keemstar landing on top. Until now. And that's because smile for YouTube. Basher's associate, or the person that was in the call when the leaked Skype audio of his ex-girlfriend was exposed to him. Because in 2016, a little less than a year after the video dropped, he leaked a Skype call between him, Basher, and Keem that puts a new perspective on all this because Smile for YouTube didn't always go under that alias. In 2010, he was known as 101 SWAT 101, and he's exactly the kind of person you would expect with someone with that name to have. And unbeknownst to Keem, back in 2010, he allegedly also made trolling videos with him, and that's why he had FAG re-uploads on his channel. But of course, with five years passing and all the people that Keem has met, he didn't recognize him at all. But there was some suspicion that was successfully diverted by a lie on Smile's side, as he did not want his cover blown. Hey, uh, are you a big time fan of mine? Because I searched you on YouTube and I saw like FAG re-uploaded videos. Uh, FAG uploaded videos? Re-uploaded videos, like my old trolling videos? Oh, I'm not sure, man. I, I, well, fuck, years back I was watching your videos. Years back. Yeah, I searched Smile for YouTube on, or on YouTube, and there's a channel, and it's got, like, re-uploaded videos of my old stuff. Oh, no, that wouldn't be me. Uh, I'm Smile for YouTube Gaming. Oh, okay. Well, that's a weird coincidence. That is a weird coincidence. <laughs> that is actually really fucked. But before we get into the meat of this call, there is also a website that docks Clara and several other content creators' residents posted by an anonymous source. A dox that Keemstar clearly knew about and spread it anyway. Don't worry. Are you going to report on the uh, website? Um, well, I haven't really looked at the website. Like, I just, <laughs> You're going to like it. Liking. Oh, you're gonna like it. <laughs> oh, you're gonna like Except it. Except she's going really down. Bad. Even shows her bedroom window and everything. Like it's some creeper, man. <laughs> yeah, I don't know shit. how the fuck they got this stuff, but it's creepy. It was definitely another YouTube partner out there that's I'm doing this. Gonna, I'm gonna tweet it out. I'm gonna say, "Oh my God, have you seen this?" <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> you star, dude. I hated you at first, but I'm starting to fucking love you. Now for the most important part of this call is that that interview was all orchestrated, scripted, redone, and dramatized, because they all knew about this info beforehand, and it was all done to take Clara down and build Basher up. Okay, this is the game plan. Alright, you get her in this private call, you record her saying this stuff, okay? Mm. Then, we come on and we do the interview, right? And I say something like, and you tell me the background, I'm saying, other than this text, do you have any proof? Like, do you have any real proof? I know she said this to you in a private Skype conversation, you know, smile for YouTube. But, I mean, there's going to be a lot of people out there that say, you know, that you're full of shit. There's going to be a lot of people out there saying that, you know, maybe you and Basher made a deal behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Do you have any legitimate proof that she said this? I mean, these conversations can be forged. And then you interrupt me and you're just yes, like... Yes, sir, I do. I, I have, got a video, I, I got an audio right now. I got... Okay, give me the audio. And then we play it in the interview. Oh my god, it's over. <laughs> Coming from Drama Alert. Okay, my fans are fucking... They're not just to like... And I'll everyone. even react. I'll even There's... react like I've never heard it. I said to him, literally, uh, you could pay me $40 and I'll talk to him, but you'll have to pay me probably more than that. Literally asking him to pay <laughs> her. While Keemstar later defended this by saying all the information in the interview was true and it was only the reaction that was faked or rather redone, many still opposed it because of its deceptive nature. And that took away credibility from Keemstar and put into question his other videos. But there is another, more important level to this on the same note of deception. Manipulation. Something Keemstar initially accused Basher of. And this is important because it expands more on drama alert and the power Keem holds, or the way he used to use it in 2015. At the start of this drama, Keem started off stalwart and attacked Basher relentlessly, citing his parental status and that crimes like these should always be brought into question, and was doing a fair job of covering Basher's alleged victims. 
but after he went on good terms with him, he stopped bringing the potential victims to light, as seen on Camp Kill Commentary's channel who kept on covering it. So this exposes much about how Keemstar operated his channel. It's something people both love and hate him for, which is his loyalty to his allies, as a neutral news channel may bring all perspectives on a story. But Drama Alert was becoming a commentary news channel, no doubt directly supported by its rise in views, as this series of videos brought only the perspectives that reflected Keem's opinion on Basher. When he was on bad terms, he only reported the victims, but when he was friendly with Basher, he stated that the hatred online that Basher was receiving was bad enough. Keemstar's words can bring down and or build up a creator depending on what terms he's on with them. As for Smile for YouTube, who leaked the Skype call, in most people's eyes, he is no hero, as besides trying to charge back $2,500 in donations to Keem, he helped spread Keem's docs and tweeted many suggested tweets that refer to swatting Keem, though he denies he ever swatted Keem. But Keemstar is also hardly a saint, as within this feud, he gave out Smile's Skype, Smile's number, Smile's address, and even Smile's wife's phone number with a fucking father he's an adult and i have trolled him so hard that his life is consumed by the thought of me all right his skype is literally smile for youtube keep note of all this that's his skype right there giving out my house address giving out all of my information because he this thinks this is this is his phone number the guys from canada this is his wife's phone number right here he needs this dude's address we need to drop his address <laughs> you get so need, people need to know where this dude lives. Now I'm gonna get swatted. Look at them all there. They're fucking everywhere. These cops are everywhere. <laughs> Thank you. I wonder who fucking did. Reactions are typically mixed on this as he was doxing a doxer. But one thing many people take issue with is involving his wife that had seemingly no involvement in the situation. Which means he doxed an innocent party. But overall, at least compared to other controversies that Keem was involved in at this time, it went by relatively unknown. And actually, Keem was still doing very well for himself, as he more than doubled his subscribers in 2015, helped by the audience he gained through the Bashiverse coverage and the many friendships he made with other rising content creators like Pyrocynical. But more importantly, Leafy is here, a commentator known for his insults and feuds with the more bizarre denizens of YouTube. Leafy and Keemstar formed a very close friendship, where almost daily they would talk on Skype for hours and even met up in person where they took a ride in a helicopter. Maybe they built their bond by being controversial rising figures in the YouTube community, which takes us back to the controversies that Keem was going through. Some having to do with the change in perspective and recirculation on his old clip insulting Alex. But his newest controversy at the time was because he got a story wrong. All because a member of his news team failed to properly do their research, made it all worse because of Keem's size. When he was going after Basher, Basher had about 1.7 million subs and Keem had about 300,000. Though influence spans beyond subscribers, this is simply just the easiest way to measure it. So Keemstar had about one-fifth of Basher's following and the predator accusations had merit. There were also many other people accusing Basher of the same thing. And with Basher's large following and experience with managing an audience of that size surely helped him through it. Which is how we transition to Sir Tony Ray, better known as RS Glory and Gold. A 62 year old man that streams the MMORPG RuneScape 3 on Twitch. That on January 7th sat at 6.6 thousand followers. Just joining the streaming scene, he was very new to the online community that took him in with open arms until someone on the Drama Alert team discovered something alerting. A news article dating back from 2011 about a 54-year-old man that through RuneScape, the same game RS Glory and Gold is playing, was incarcerated for illegal acts with a 13-year-old girl that he met through the game and eventually in person. And through a quick glance, these photos do look a bit similar, and the same game is being played. The problem comes with that the employee of Drama Alert that brought these to Keem only went off that information for such a serious claim. If he gave any effort beyond a surface level glance, this team member would have seen that John Phillips was still incarcerated, so it would be impossible for RS Glory and Gold to be streaming on Twitch unless he was streaming from jail. This fatal error wasn't caught until it was too late. 
as Keemstar, having confidence in his news team, set aside a about 35 second segment to report on this. Massachusetts man John Phillips had sex with teen he married in an online game of RuneScape. He recently got out of jail and the first thing he did was stream RuneScape on Twitch. And if Keemstar's videos get around 100,000 views within hours of an upload, that means Ed exposed that dangerous lie to an audience around 16 times larger than Sir Tony Ray had. And the result is as you would might expect. With many furious people misled with this information at the return of a predator visiting Sir Tony Ray's channel and harassing him, Keemstar, quickly learning of his error, deleted his video and re-uploaded another one titled, We Got It Wrong, explaining his disappointment and his team and himself and committing himself to make amends in whatever way possible. Him and another person on my news team sat there for hours looking at the faces and identified who was who and that it was the right guy and I just, I fucking lost it. My heart sunk into my stomach. The minute he gave me this explanation that they matched the faces, I realized that we just so fucked up. And I just, I fucking died right there on my live stream. Like, I immediately took down the video. And I immediately uploaded a video to Twitter telling everyone that we got this story wrong and that we've taken the video and that the guy that works for me is no longer working for me and any damages that we've caused this guy, Tony, that we are going to take. But by then, it was too late. Many channels were already reporting on it, with the largest being Scarce, a competitor to Drama Alert. And where Scarce's videos usually hit on average 200,000 views, the one covering Keemstar and Sir Tony Ray got 1 million views in five days' time strengthened by a clip of Tony being subjected to unwarranted harassment. Uh, in his press broadcast, you can tell the dude's depressed, the dude's crying, and you can tell that he's just like, fuck, dude, like, I didn't do anything wrong. He's trying to tell people that he didn't do anything wrong, and people are still telling him in the chat, like, these horrible things and stuff because of the video that was uploaded, and it just makes me really sad, dude. Okay, from what I gather here, you're saying that finally this guy who posted this video has taken the video down, and admitted that what he said wasn't true. And that uh, now everybody in the world knows my real name is Tony Ray Winchester. I'm 62. I've retired. I haven't got my first Social Security check yet, but I'll get it soon. Uh, see, I would have sat here for the next 10 years because uh, I'm not going to let somebody run me off but now that the whole thing's cleared up and you guys know I'm a good guy, I'd like to go take a break. Wash my face. Put some cold water on my face. Have a cup of coffee. Relax for a minute. And then I'll come back and start tweeting again. Or twi twitching again, okay? I I'm not calling him. I'm not telling him my phone number. I don't want that guy to bother me no matter what. I don't want his money. I don't want his apology. <laughs> Cause you know, uh, I know who and what I am, and my real friends know who and what I am, and they stuck by me. Thank you very much for everything, and, and don't think I'll ever forget all the nice words you folks had to say to me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But believe me, I would never, ever, ever get off here. As long as somebody's saying those things about me, because I'm not letting nobody run me off. But now everything's clear. Everybody knows I'm I'm Tony, and I never did nothing to nobody, and I'm a good guy. So now I want to take a break. Thank you guys for everything. Thank you very much for being nice people and kind-hearted and helping me when I really needed your help. Thank you. Before I log out, happy birthday, Renee. Thanks for being a real friend. I appreciate it. In this situation, it's hard to say that anyone really prospered. But there was a silver lining that Sir Tony Ray's Twitch exploded in support shortly after he overcame these false accusations. 
As for Drama Alert, this mess up hardly hindered its growth, as it only lost subscribers for one day and continued its climb through the YouTube ranks like nothing ever happened. As for Keem, though he was doing what he could to fix the situation, like many of his past controversial events, this was thrown into a pile of controversial acts that as time would go on would mostly be forgotten. And that's because the earlier months of 2016 were pretty good for Keem. A little over a month after this most recent controversy, Trauma Alert hit 1 million subscribers. But the biggest change happened behind the scenes. As Keemstar explained it, since his time on YouTube, there are some that grew up watching him and now have jobs at YouTube itself. Through this, he was finally able, once and for all, get cleared for promoting that scam several years back. Meaning instead of relying on a loophole of not owning Drama Alert but being allowed to appear on it, he was now granted ownership of the channel and is able to manage it without constraints. Not only that, YouTube was changing in a way that boosted Drama Alert faster than it ever has. As 2016 is remembered as a heavily drama-laden year, with the likes of Leafy is here and H3H3 battling it out, there was much to cover, and it helped thrive views as much as you'd expect to a channel called Drama Alert. With each of Kim's videos averaging on the lower end 500,000 views, and on the higher end well over a million. But with 2016 being such a drama-laden year, Keemstar eventually found himself stuck in the center of it, and not in the way he preferred. It was all sparked through one of the business ventures Keem was doing outside of Drama Alert. While he was still diversifying his revenue streams through merch, live streaming, sponsorships, esports, and various other avenues, he was also helping establish events between content creators when necessary. One of these events was meant to be a boxing match between iDubs, a rising content creator known for reviewing strange kickstarters, and more recently his content cop series where he called out what he and many other agree to be lazy or scandalous content on YouTube. And that's where Jinx and iDubs' content cop on him came in, criticizing his reaction content. Things escalated between the two, and a boxing match was planned with Keemstar setting up the event for March 4th. And though Jinx was combative on Twitter and eager for the match, he never showed up, making iDubs the automatic victor. And that's why Keem and iDubs were in touch. Also around this time, Keemstar's Alex video was making its seasonal return, fueled mostly by his recent controversy with Sir Tony Ray. iDubs noticing this tweeted out the Alex clip. But instead of leaving it there, Keemstar private messaged iDubs asking not to use that clip or he will have to ruin iDubs' career like he's done with other content creators that appeared on Drama Alert. Though Keem says this was a joke, iDubs definitely did not take it as one and had something bigger, mayhaps in retaliation, in the works. And that is the most effective and memorable expose on Keemstar. And that's saying much considering the existence of all these exposés on him already. So about halfway through the year on May 5th, 2016, iDubs dropped Content Cop Keemstar. What made this video vastly different from the rest is that where most exposés on Keemstar focus on specific events rather than analyzing Keemstar's character, like easy to denounce events such as the Alex situation or his misinformation on Sir Tony Ray, iDubs instead analyzed Keemstar on a day-to-day -day basis and not truly on its low points as he showcased what he deemed to be Keemstar's consistent hypocrisy and manipulativeness through several points throughout the video, with examples taken through his Twitter rants and Drama Alert. An example is how outwardly it may seem that Drama Alert is meant to be a non-biased news show, but in reality, the way Keemstar typically reports stories is based on the relationship with the other person. This coupled with his constant instigation on Twitter to have creators appear on his show or continue to receive his mass spreading of rumors painted Keemstar as an even more unfavorable person. There are a lot of reasons to call Keemstar a hypocrite. I'm going to focus on one reason, the reason that I find most compelling. My objective isn't go destroy their life on Dromler. I don't use my platform that way. You know how they've been contacting me saying that you've been dating some like 14 year old French girl and shit? Just please swing at me. If you're gonna swing at me, swing at me, dude. Let me know because I got a fucking files on top of files to swing back at. I don't use my platform that way. I don't use my platform that way. I don't use my platform that way. Because I got a fucking files on top of files to swing back at. Well, that was extremely blatant. You said you don't use your platform that way, but then you threatened to use your platform that way. But I dubs. The Keemstar Twitter account and Drama Alert are two separate entities. I try to keep my show fair and balanced, but on Twitter, I'm gonna give my opinion. I heard you're a pedophile. 14-year-old French girl? Mm, pedophile. 
I, I have the taste of pedophile come in my mouth. I'm on the hunt. Thinking about it logically. You want big YouTubers to come onto your program after you harass them on Twitter. So how are you going to get them to come on your program? Oh, I know. You suggest that if they don't come on your program, they're not innocent. The situation turns out where a big YouTuber comes on because he's innocent. Of course, that's just part one. We got to think about the second part logically as well. If you are a small YouTuber, you're gonna get a big fucking sub boost from it. And guess what? I won't let you fucking forget it. I will hold that shit over your head. If, if you fucking blink in my direction, I'm gonna hold that shit over your head. Along with other examples of Keem's hypocrisy and explaining Keemstar's general aggression, Idubs also succeeded in making it entertaining in a way that while it did carry many serious points, it also served to mock Keemstar because the first about four or so minutes of the video is him tracking down and wrestling a garden gnome. Though that insult wasn't started by Idubs, it was solidified by him, which is why enemies of Keem still refer to him as a garden gnome. As for the effect that this video had on Keemstar's channel, if we look at Social Blade for that time, we can see that it did absolutely nothing. In fact, Keemstar gained more subscribers than usual around this time. But as the video got more and more viewership, its influence started to take effect. The big difference this time, to the many other times the masses have gone against Keemstar, is that now his influential friends started turning on him. How it's usually remembered is that IW's content cop was the sole instigator in this situation, but the reality is there were already many exposés attacking Keemstar prior to IW's video. His video was just the straw that broke the camel's back. The next biggest expose video on Keemstar came out a little over a month later by Pyrocynical, an ex-friend of Keem's. Keemstar also does this really cancerous thing where he'll accuse someone of something or make something up, and then when he's called out, he'll say that someone told him or people have been telling him, which basically gives him a line of defense for some bullshit that he just made up five minutes ago. Pyro is threatening me with all this shit on Skype because I showed his picture. Play that again. You know how they've been contacting me saying that you've been dating some like 14 year old French girl and shit? Dating some like 14 year old French girl and shit? 14 year old French girl and shit? 14 year old French girl and shit? Now, if any of you didn't notice that, he just deliberately lowered the age. Now, originally, this alleged girl was 15, and now Keemstar has lowered the age to 14, probably to make it sound even more impacting and incriminating. And guess what? Later on stream, he lowered the age again to say the girl was now 13, and on top of that, basically insinuating that I was a pedophile. Pyro was trying to hook up with a 13-year-old fr uh, girl from France, all right, that he was technically like a people or a weirdo or something, right? So this man has lied about the age of this girl on two separate occasions, and knowing Keemstar, this girl will probably be an embryo by next week. Weirdly enough, this video is almost exactly the same length of Idubs' content cop. But as for the video itself, beyond the changing of mood towards Keemstar, this video seemed to have been instigated by Keem's constant rumor spreading on Pyrocynical, as seen in the video. Also, Keem tweeted out Pyro's face, which was mostly unknown at the time. Mostly unknown because a few months back, Pyro's face was revealed with consent on a video that got over a million views, something that Pyro failed to mention. As for what caused the falling out in the friendship, Keemstar, whenever he hears that someone said something bad about him to any degree, he will usually go on offense. And that's where things usually snowball. A small criticism towards Keem, if it's said behind his back, can turn into a feud that will last several years. The difference now is that Keemstar was being watched very closely, and he couldn't get away with attacking other creators as viciously as he could before. Also, with Pyro's video coming out, Keemstar was finally starting to bleed subscribers, and he was weakened enough for other, less effective Keemstar expose videos to be made, which is typical for any sort of cancellation where even those with the smallest interaction with the council person will make their own video to rake in views and add more to the massive amount of noise already being made. But the extreme levels of videos being made against Keemstar became exhausting extremely fast, as it almost became a meme to post a Keemstar expose video, due to the fact that many of these ineffective videos recycled Keemstar's old but popular controversial clips. There were also some that covered lesser known clips like when Keemstar fought someone or him shoving ice cream in what he claims to be a child actor's face, a skit done for the Bad Kids cast that Keem actually refused to upload because he later saw how bad it made him look, but Blade uploaded it anyway. 
As for what many saw as the most distasteful of these lesser known clips, was Keemstar, during a beef with content creator Total Biscuit, said that he can't wait to report on his death. Hmm, can't wait to report your death! <laughs> Though Keem said it in jest, these words stuck with many, as Total Biscuit several months ago announced that he was suffering from a terminal cancer. Back to the cancellation itself, one of, if not the worst part of this for Keem was having his close friends betray him. The worst offender being Leafy, who admittedly distanced himself from Keemstar as a business decision. These past few months, he's honestly just gone fucking insane. Here's a perfect example. A certain YouTuber by the name of Colossal is Crazy made a tweet saying he's gonna make a video about Keemstar. And how does Keemstar respond to this? Get this, by threatening to release his personal info on where he fucking lives. You're obsessed with me. I have a portfolio of all your tweets mentioning me. When your pedo video hits, expect a response. Docs too. Even Bashiverse, the content creator with a troubled past that Keemstar later helped build up, jumped on the bandwagon of Keemstar hate, which crushed Keem even further. On to lawyers in Kentucky, and we've asked about taking this to court. They have absolutely no idea about the internet. Every time I've gone to legal representative, they're absolutely blown away that people can make money off of YouTube. That's how out of the loop they are. Me and Clara need help. Like, so much freaking help right now. And we don't know what else to do or where to turn. Last time we tried to do this, somehow Keemstar found out and then threatened to spread more rumors about random girls to destroy me. If you wish to help us, please spread this video. I need someone in legal to see this and help us because we have no idea how to go about this or even where to start. We love every single one of you who have stuck by our sides this whole time and never left. So, seriously, thank you. Hey, listen, Basher, here's the problem. Here's the problem. Is that you thought you were a fucking genius manipulator. But someone's better than you. Because I got you to talk about me and to let your audience know about my existence for months. And once they knew who I was, then I released this video. So many people know about this subject and my point of view of it than ever before. Because I got you to react to me and I got you to play victim to me. And I got you to pander to your audience. And now that they're paying attention, this whole forget him and ignore him would have worked if you would have done it right away. But now that you haven't, I got your fans' attention. How good of a manipulator to give us some more insight on Keem's old controversies, this cancellation, and a bit of context of future things Keem would go through, I interviewed content creator Tommy C. SFTP, who would later host a podcast with Keem. Considering what um, Basher had done, that he, you know, Keem was responsible for reducing him, and he reduced him because he, th he felt like he was getting kind of a raw deal from his girlfriend. I think he thought maybe... Um, I don't know the details of, you know, whatever had happened when he was a kid, he was 18, 19 years old. Maybe that was a mistake. You know, we'd find on that there would be a pattern, but we didn't know this at the time. Uh, I'm certainly Keem didn't know that at the time. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was a, you know, it was a give and take relationship. They both got a lot more famous. It's one of the greatest stories in drama alert history between him and Basher. And I can say that he was personally hurt, um, when Basher, and, and like I said, during the leaf, he said, I need money and I need money because, you know, Keem was the most hated person on the internet uh, to go sue Keemstar. And it was probably a scam of some sort. He never did. And he disappeared off the internet until about 2019, um, disappeared again and uh, unfortunately passed away recently. There is no doubt that Keem will now be on edge and even more defensive when it comes to his inner circle after this betrayal. As to show the collaborative efforts against Keemstar, Leafy, Pyrocynical, Grady Underay, Vex, and iDub's videos got views in the multi-millions. Keem did make efforts to fix his image by justifying and apologizing for his actions in a 51-minute video uploaded to Drama Alert in June of 2016. 
First, Keemstar addresses one of the biggest, earliest expose videos by a channel that goes by Chosen. That's right, encouraging suicide. This already highlights a massive problem with the video Keem is making. He does address many of his mistakes, like when he docks the content creator's Skype, or other lesser-known rants where Keem starts trolling and insulting other people while using things like their race to attack them, or how he reported false allegations that hurt Toby Turner's channel severely. Though he fails to address everything. But it's not like these expose videos did a much better job, as most of them were poorly made and lacked much context and research. But with Keemstar's style of video, everything needed to be addressed and put out there. Like in the beginning of Chosen's video, there's a Twitter screenshot of Scare saying Keemstar DM'd him his parents' house address. And with there being much evidence of Keemstar doxing in the past, his intentions were most likely not good here. At least that's what we can go off of because Keem never addressed it. He does address the Alex situation, but more importantly, the clip of saying he hates his fans, which he says was a joke, but it's actually more probable that he doesn't remember the situation. So, I, th I think what I noticed, right, at least, Keen confuses timelines a lot. So, that became satirical. Mm -hmm. that, that initial clip was, like, what started it all. And what happened was, because, like, Keen makes a bunch of, like, trolling videos, he, he then he started doing trolling online, yeah. through live stream, and then, like, fans mm -hmm. kept, like, joining in and being assholes and ruining, like, the, the whole trolling thing. So, he, because he couldn't troll, like, fans, because they mm -hmm. were on it, right? Well, I showed that video to him in 2016, and I can attest, I swear, my kids, he said, I don't remember, I've made so much bullshit over the years. And this is what he said privately to me, I don't know when I said that. Is I keep seeing it, but he could, at the time he couldn't remember. And then I had a fan approach me. He told me that he was on with uh, Basher, and they were fooling around. And that clip is really out of context. That's what I've been told. I've never seen the evidence for it. But when I sh when when that clip was flowing around, floating around during the Great A under A and Leafy situation, he told me, and it sounded legitimate, and it wasn't a private phone call that he simply didn't remember saying that, and he doesn't he doesn't even know what it was from. That's what he told me. This happens quite a bit with Kim, being that he's been on the internet for so long that his day-to-day -day activities can be difficult to remember because they're so packed full of dramatic events. So it's very believable that he genuinely believes he was joking when he later watched the video and is relying on others' information to fill in the blanks. But relying on others is a very dangerous thing to do online, or worse, when running an online news channel, like what happened with Sir Tony Ray or the accusations against Power Cynical. It should be mentioned that prior to releasing this video, after losing 200,000 subscribers and Scarce being promoted so much as Keemstar's competitor that he gained 1 million subscribers, it was enough. And for what seemed to be the first time, Keemstar left the internet. In the meantime, he had another content creator covering for him while he went on a retreat with close friends and drink. So when he returned a little over a week later, he released that video, and for the most part the hate was dying down, or it was at least reduced to what it was prior to his retreat. This event almost fully got Keemstar off the internet, but on the other end, there were still many things keeping him on. Not just considering his passion for his new show, but also his podcast that went by the name Baited. Hosted mainly by Keemstar, Colossal is crazy that greatly opposed Keemstar and Tommy C, who was the moderator. While we won't delve too much into this podcast, I will recommend Turkey Tom's video covering it. The main takeaways is that it helped Keemstar make amends with many content creators like Leafy is here that now had the shared experience of being the subject of a content cop. So a lot of hate jumped from Keemstar to Leafy. But refocusing to Keemstar and his post-cancellation, Keem claims that when he returned, he embraced the bias in his reporting. In the end, it is his channel, and it can be understandable that things that he hyperfixates on are also the things he wants to report on. And now that all this dirty laundry was meticulously picked at by the internet for a month, viewers and creators had a full grasp of Keem, which gave him a unique immunity and power, because he now had everything out there, meaning that any future controversy would be much less impactful as it'd be placed alongside his list of previous controversies. And because he had so many of them, as grievous as doxing, there was little that could be said that would tarnish his image more than it already was. Even viewers could appreciate that you can get a full grasp of Keemstar as opposed to the more clean-cut creators. And there is no doubt he brought more himself into Drama Alert. Regardless, YouTube was a dramatic mess all around in 2016. The viewers knew this, the content creators knew this, and it's been revealed that apparently YouTube knew about this too and were extremely worried about how it was negatively affecting the platform and therefore the companies that advertised on it. 
I got this information through an interview with Pescator, a seemingly controversial figure within the community that was the head of the Drama Alert news team from mid-2017 to 2019. They had to call in a special little conference back then when it was uh, Leafy and Keemstar were getting into it. That was real. Uh, they want. They were almost. <clears throat> excuse me. They were almost gonna um, delete their channels, or I think at least get rid of their the YPP, the YouTube Partner Program. I think they were gonna get rid of their uh, AdSense, but they didn't at the time. Later on, they did it to Leafy, but Keem knew he was smart enough to know I've got to change. I've got to, you know, I've got to change with this platform. So he did. And, you know, that's just the way it goes. It could have been this that prompted Keemstar to release his mission statement, asking for a friendlier environment. But no matter what Keem did, he could not reach the viewership that he had in the earlier months of 2016, as his views were dropping drastically through the end of the year, with his competitor scares outperforming him every month. Again, this is partly helped by him being boosted by other content creators as an alternative to Keemstar. By the start of 2017, though much of the drama around Keemstar had died down, it was very clear that his viewership was dying down along with it. So he had yet another problem in front of him. But instead of getting better, things just got worse. Worse than his competition was scarce and worse than having to rebuild his drama alert team. As many remember, 2017 was the year of the apocalypse because the drama that 2016 was remembered for and the edgy humor that bled into the beginning months of 2017 was made all the more worse when traditional news networks covered PewDiePie who was doing things that many consider to be highly controversial acts, at least on the surface level. This and other questionable actions across YouTube had many advertisers leaving in panic. The end result was content creators' videos getting demonetized in mass, as YouTube was experimenting with its new algorithm meant to promote and monetize family-friendly videos, and because they really needed to build the confidence of advertisers back up, they erred on the side of extreme caution. So many channels that lacked truly controversial content saw their paychecks being slashed. Keemstar himself saw only 10% of the revenue he would usually get. Where many creators quit, took breaks, or reformatted their content, Keemstar kept going, and actually for this time period, fully removed ads off his videos so that the smaller YouTubers could get the small amount of advertisements flowing through YouTube. But there was still a benefit in this for Keem, and that was other creators, mainly Scarce, were struggling too. To the point that Scarce stopped making videos for two months. Though Scarce says he left because of family issues, Keemstar says it was most likely the money. While it might seem reasonable that during your worst performing months, money-wise would be opportune for a break, this was actually the absolute worst time that Scarce could have left. And that's because of the Vine invasion of YouTube. With that platform shut down, many of those creators migrated to YouTube, and among those was Jake and Logan Paul. Drama machines that bounced off each other and captivated millions of children while simultaneously annoying millions of adults. Though the commentary community was still in a bit of a rut, they could all agree on their hatred for the Paul brothers. But not Keemstar. His first video covering Jake was on the Everyday Bro song that introduced Jake to the majority of YouTube. This video's performance was mediocre. But then he covered him again. And again. And again for about 7 videos in a row, only interrupted by the video saying that he won't be on Drama Alert for a few days. And for the first time in a year, Keem's channel was on a climb. Prior to Jake Paul, his videos were getting about half a million views. Post Jake Paul, he was getting a million to three million views per video, just in time for ads to stabilize a bit more, turn them back on, and make hundreds of thousands of dollars. As for how this affected the content itself, it's no secret that Jake Paul harbored a younger audience of children and young teenagers. Possibly in response to this, Keemstar was more animated and less vulgar, which went perfectly when adapting to Jake's younger audience. This also went hand in hand with being more family friendly. Though Drama Alert was outperforming Scarce significantly view wise when he came back in July, Scarce still had about a million more subscribers than him. But just three months later, with content packed with the Paw Brothers drama, Drama Alert passed Scarce. But let's look at the bigger picture. Let's take a look at the global news rankings on YouTube for this time. A capture for August 29, 2017 shows Drama Alert, according to Social Blade, outperforming CNN. 
Vox, MSNBC, CBS, Fox News, and BBC News. Also many other traditional and non-traditional news channels. There was no argument. Drum Alert was back, and it was back on top. Peaking at 61 billion views a month showed again that Keemstar's persistence had once again paid off. While many of these videos covering the drama around Jake Paul were just quick retelling of his videos, there was quite a bit of interviews and information gathered behind the scenes that allowed Drama Alert to get exclusive information and also get stories out faster than other channels. But there was a time where it was nothing to get 10,000 new subs off a, you know, a, a video just about Jake Paul being in his house and you know uh, what girls came by. You know, it was crazy, man. We had uh, inside sources along that whole road. I actually had, uh, I talked with a lady across the street from the house and uh, courted her as an asset. And every day she would tell me exactly what's going on. And one morning she she called me up, on, well, she DM'd me and she said, how much would y'all pay me for a picture of uh, all of Team 10 lined up on the wall with the cops? I said, we don't pay, we don't pay for stories. That's one thing we don't do. Uh, you know, if you want to give it to us, we'll credit you, whatever. And she said, okay. She sent me that picture of all of Team 10 lined up against the wall uh, with uh, that guy Nick turned when they got swatted. It was one of the greatest pictures I'd ever seen as far as, like, scandalous. And we put that as a thumbnail, and he did the whole story. He doesn't like doing swatting stories, but he did a story on that. And I remember that, that video went bonkers. It was like almost 3 million views. You would think that one of these drama-oriented videos would have been Keemstar's most viewed video of 2017. No, that position belongs to the rehashing of his 2012 hit, Dollar in the Woods. Fitting the dramatization of the diss tracks floating around at the time, this video eventually got up to 11 million views. As silly as it was, it really helped encapsulate how Keem, in a year's time went from being one of the most hated creators on the internet to still being a hated creator but also achieving a sort of meme status as his character was becoming more well known and accepted throughout the online community. As hated as he was, he still had more character, energy, and a talent to entertain that most content creators could hope to have. He was partly a reality star of YouTube who gained even more respect from the community when in December of 2017, he interviewed a swatter. A swatter whose phone call got someone killed. Though at first this sounds horrible, as Keemstar gave a platform to someone like that. But the truth was, Keem and his team had the intention of bringing this person on to get them to confess on the show. To Keem's surprise, it worked immediately. So you you swatted that address, correct? Sure. Okay, right. so you swatted the address, you put in the, the fake hostage situation, correct? Yep. And then this guy gets killed. That's what happened, I guess. But blindsided by this quick submission, Keem, as he claims, struggled to continue the interview, at least in an optimal state. Quick update for those of you that might not know yet, uh, the swatter has been arrested. And my main objective with the interview was to get him to verbally confess to what took place. Like, that was my only goal. And I had all these strategies and all these techniques that I would pull the truth out of him. But as you saw in the interview, he verbally confessed to it like right off the bat. And then I was just lost. I got so much praise all around the world saying that I did a good job on the interview. But quite frankly, I, I did a really bad job. As soon as he gave me the confession, like I didn't know where to go from there. He asked, I asked him about, you know, do you have parents? He said he doesn't have parents. Like, there should have been a follow-up question. Like, what do you mean? And then the guy just kept throwing me off by not being remorseful at all or, or sorry for what took place. I, w I was just like at a loss for words. Like, my brain... But the following day, Keemstar brought the welcome news that the swatter was arrested, ending the episode by promoting a GoFundMe for the family that fell victim to the swatting. That interview. Now, I want to let my audience know that there is a GoFundMe to help pay for funeral expenses for the family of the victim. That link is the top link in the description of this video. Even if there was a bit of opposition against Keemstar for monetizing that interview and bringing us water on a platform, the majority of viewers appreciated the intention and action of helping get us water behind bars, as this is regarded as one of the best things Drama Alert has ever done. 
ending a strong year with a strong action. Moving on to 2018, while it still did well viewership-wise, no individual month came close to surpassing Drama Alert's peak month the year prior. But if it wasn't obvious then, it was by May 2018 that Keemstar had several revenue streams and as he expanded them, Drama Alert was an ever-decreasing stream compared to the money he was receiving from his other ventures, namely Friday Fortnite. What many accepted to be the first competitive Fortnite competition that was to happen weekly with the prize pool increasing with each weekly airing. Though the specifics of the rules of the tournament are not of extreme importance to this video, the controversies and success of it are. As for how this happened, Keem has always delved into competitive gaming and gaming teams. Some projects were more successful than others, but Friday Fortnite was his biggest success thus far in that field. It may have been even influenced by his newly adapted audience of children and teenagers that tuned in for his continued coverage of the Paw Brothers. Regardless, the problems with the tournament came with Keem's operation of it, one that is objectively not fair, but operates for the sake of entertainment and not to see who was the top Fortnite player. As contention began building when Keemstar stated that these events were made for just that, entertainment. He was not seeking the best Fortnite players, but rather the most entertaining ones and the ones that he mostly had a good repertoire with. His Twitter post explaining this did not please the many that were good at the game but lacked the size to compete, creating a rich get richer controversy until Fortnite started hosting their own competitive events. Still following the format of rhyming a weekday with a game came other successful competitions that pitted popular YouTubers and streamers alike, like Minecraft Mondays, that was officially established in 2019. This, like its many predecessors, pulled in millions of unique viewers across several streams and also towards the sponsorships of the events like G Fuel, arguably the largest and most memorable sponsor of Keemstar that could be found through a multitude of Keem's projects. But in reality, this is not the actual timeline. A timeline where Keemstar's biggest controversy between 2018 and 2019 was that the selection of creators who starred in his video game competition was biased was not the biggest controversy of this time. There are two major controversies that happened between then, one significantly lesser known than the other. So we'll cover the lesser known one first, and to do that we'll have to talk about the person at the center of it, Just Destiny, known now as Mori. While we won't delve too much into this situation, I will recommend Nicholas Diorio's video where he gives a detailed rundown on what happened. For the sake of brevity, we'll give a quick rundown. Back in February of 2019, Just Destiny was, and still practically is, known as a Leafy clone. But unlike Leafy, he's just focused on daytime television like many other channels around him. Through this, Just Destiny was able to get 1.7 million subscribers. So in the YouTube creator community, he was cemented as one of those many channels filling in the hole Leafy left. But he began to get much unwanted attention when his thumbnails came into question, usually clickbaiting kids and teenagers that starred in these television programs. While those questioning his choice of thumbnails were relatively small, they grew ever in size when he abused YouTube's copyright system to strike down a channel calling him a predator. Not only was this blatant abuse of the copyright system, Lt. Cobra, the channel struck, followed fair use to a T. Lt. Cobra was also a very, very small channel that was hosted by a 15-year-old. There are many aspects about this entire situation that made Lt. Cobra's video extremely unbelievable and would have been relatively unknown if Just Destiny let it be. He even went as far as to send over a cease and desist. Many creators already having issues with Just Destiny's personality had even more of a reason to hate him, as sending illegitimate takedown requests are among one of the worst things a creator can do to another creator in the online realm. So an already established group of smaller creators took it upon themselves to combat this and spread the words of his abuse. This was a group that also opposed Keemstar, which was practically the entire purpose of the group which was to grow without Keemstar's influence but their hatred of Just Destiny was greater than their hatred for Keem, so they let him in with a pretense that he would help take down this copyright abuser. And things went really, really well at first, as Keem invited Just Destiny on a show where he was able to easily counter Just Destiny's points and made it clear that he made a massive mistake by targeting the smaller channel that though he was slandering him, chose the wrong route to silence him. But there was a bit of a slip up on Keem's part. When he asked, seems really weird to me it's like to, to from the outside looking in like it makes me have to ask this question like do you yeah. touch kids oh my god really 
But but do you? Um, do you touch kids? Kim, stop asking ridiculous questions. Usually when Keemstar paints someone as a predator, he does so on Twitter and does it a bit more passively. But him asking the question outright and so sudden made his tactic where he slanders other parties by spreading rumors a bit too obvious. Maybe it was this that reminded the audience of what kind of person Keemstar could be or their general disapproval of the interview caused Keem to lose 3,000 subscribers. While Keem and other creators were able to get Just Destiny to remove the strike and walk back his actions, this wasn't enough for Keem as he lost, even in the smallest way possible. So like he does with other situations, he snowballed this into something regrettable, but not yet for Keem, as Keem's tactics of painting Just Destiny as a predator worked to an extent and was able to enlist the help of this group of content creators to be able to gather his personal information for the sake of exposing his potential predatory past. That was the narrative. Though things started to change when Keem began doing things in the group that they would see as questionable. And that is leaking information. What's his Skype name? Uh, I'm going to send it to you right now. I don't want to really share his Skype name publicly with anyone. I don't want that getting out. But I mean, yeah, I I'll send it to you. As Keem had information that no others had of just Destiny through trust. Namely his Skype as that was used to do the interview on Drama Alert. And with a little prodding, he gave this Skype to a known swatter who was helping him investigate Just Destiny. And a few failed leads later, Keem was finally able to obtain the identity of Just Destiny. Keemstar finally had access to his docs. And what he did with this extremely sensitive information was give the information to Lieutenant Cobra, who did little with it besides talk about it to other content creators. But Keemstar, in doing this, docs Just Destiny. And the act of ignorance was up, as normally Keemstar is able to play it off as he wasn't aware of the consequences of his actions, but being backed into a corner during a live stream, the mask fell off, and the truth everyone already knew came out. Stick your I dox destiny. Doxing is bad if someone has the intent to harass. Yeah, but you said you had the intent to harass Just Destiny, so wouldn't that make your dox illegal? I said that I wanted to harass him, but... That's the same as it, that means intent, Gene. <laughs> oh, whatever, yeah. I got some guilty. I'm not hacking into his shit. I'm not, I'm not doing anything but looking at public information that he posted publicly. So, you know, this whole thing where Tommy plays this big guy, and sa same thing with Nick, where they play this fucking big guy like, you know what, we have dirt on Keemstar. No, you don't. I doxed him. What are you going to do about it? And I don't give a fuck what anyone says. If you think my career is going to be ruined or hurt in any way for what I just said on this show and what I've admitted to, you're crazy. As for what happened to Keemstar, really nothing much. It was covered by many creators as the doxing is seen severely worse than a takedown of a video. And even through the many enemies Keemstar made, he was still largely unaffected because what's a drop in a bucket already overflowing with controversies? Though his next controversy did not go by so easily, and being that it is a sensitive subject that any which person has a different opinion on, we will cover this quickly and with the basic facts laid out there. This is where we talk about Etika. There are many questionable things that Keemstar universally gets hatred for, mostly due to his inability to grasp mental health, as no doubt Keemstar has a very different perspective and motivation than most people and is unfamiliar with how prevalent mental disease is and how seriously it can affect someone. Keeping this in mind, Keem had the perspective that Etika, who was having many mental breakdowns in 2018 and 19, was perhaps faking it for views. We know for a fact that he wasn't, but this is to explain Keem's mindset. To that is where Keemstar did such things such as tweet out the mental hospital that Etika was staying at. Some other examples of Keemstar's other perspectives on mental health can be well encapsulated by this tweet he made toward Gris Raygun, a content creator going through his own mental health issues in the same time period, where Keem says, Why is everyone claiming that they are suffering from mental health issues? Life is not meant to be happy 24-7. If it was, you would not know what happy is. You wouldn't be able to compare it to anything. So some of you might be sick, fine, but most of you are just babies or lying. Or a tweet made in 2019 saying, the drug companies invent all these illnesses so they could sell drugs to morons. Social anxiety is 100% a fake invented illness so they can sell you drugs and make millions. Stop being weak. Society is literally going to die if you keep this bullshit up. Not much changed on his perspective on mental health. 
when on May 19th, 2019, at the peak of a mental breakdown and fresh out of the mental hospital, Keemstar interviewed Etika on his show. Why not? Why do you fear death? Well, that's what I'm saying. That, that it's 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 scary because if you really think about it, then why live? Just yeah. jump off a cliff. If, if it's just a simulation, who cares? Movie Bird Box? Uh, no, I haven't watched that movie. I just it, I got horrible reviews. You know what happens in the movie Bird Box? Go ahead, explain it. Humanity confronts the fifth dimensional being. Team Star, you're sitting there, right? You're asking yourself, oh, let me go outside today. And yeah. guess what happens when you open the front door? You see, you see eternity swinging on maybe your playground swing set. Or you see eternity sitting in your car. You see something that doesn't belong, something more powerful than you. A lot of human beings can't handle something outside of their understanding. And that's why they fear what they don't understand. Now in the movie Bird Box, rather than humanity killing what they don't understand, what they don't understand kills humanity. More select clips of Keemstar's interview are consistently recycled through the internet. As to why these clips are constantly cycled is because a month later, Etika was found dead by his own hands. There was much sadness, confusion, disbelief, and hatred going around the community throughout this time. Some that Keemstar was not exempt from as he received much hatred for his prior interview with Etika. But also people brought in counterpoints that showed Etika's repertoire of the Keemstar, namely in a live stream done on October 29, 2018. Wait, we're here for hours, you know what I'm saying? Mitzvah, um, another donation bullshit? came through, man. Let me see here. Let's see Shut what Keemstar is saying. We're gonna, we're gonna check him out. Um, Ninpal, if I disagree with Keemstar, it won't be the first time, man. Like, I disagree with him on so many things, but I still find him entertaining. You know what I mean? So it's like, hey, if he says something aggressive towards me, I don't really mind, man. Let's keep looking. Um, I don't want to get... Okay, um, Keemstar says, I actually like Etika. I don't think he's evil like Fousey, but he's definitely manic as fuck. He always acts like this. Nah, not like this. Actually, yeah, just like this, Keemstar. <laughs> I mean, I mean, yo, it's, it's... But, you know, Keemstar, you can't be mad at him for saying that, bro. He hasn't been around. It's not like he's a fucking fan. Keemstar literally didn't know of my existence until, like, what, only a year ago with the whole CND swatting thing. So don't be mad at Keemstar for this, guys. Like, don't, I don't see why y'all are being mad in a sense because uh, it was a very manic thing that I did. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not in the ward anymore more and i don't have any crazy medicine to take there's some anxiety pills for two weeks or whatever so it's like and it's not necessarily something to be mad at don't be mad at keemstar it's all right man like i'm not willing to i'm not holding anything against this nigga and i don't give a fuck i'm not sucking his dick either fuck keemstar but i mean but fuck it why be mad at this nigga um keem deleted a tweet also i mean i don't know why we're looking at keem but you know he's a very interesting guy also with this etika's mother and ex-girlfriend came out saying that keem had no part in etika's passing and that he was actually quite a large fan of his. But this developed into multiple sides arguing against each other, bringing in third parties wanting his passing to be drama free and not to be remembered as a drama revolving around Keemstar or other parties, but a tragedy and a reminder that mental health should be taken seriously. But it was brought up again in major light the very next year in 2020 through none other than H3H3's content nuke where this wound was reopened by Ethan. Also showing another clip of content creator FouseyTube's manic episodes against Keemstar in 2018, where after a failed event, Fousey got on top of a car and said, Hey, I'm just telling you as a man at 28 years old what I feel. You made me want to commit suicide last year. I wanted to kill myself because of all the attention you gave me. I rewatch videos going viral after the attention you're giving me now of you saying, Fousey is the biggest piece of shit egotistical asshole on this earth. I have bipolar and depression. That what you put into my head made me want to kill myself! And that is the extent that we will talk about it. With that, we can talk about what this content nuke even was and why H3H3 took such opposition against Keemstar. And according to Pescator, this is something Keem snowballed as well, as it all originated through a comment H3H3 made in 2017 when Keemstar appeared in H3's podcast. He's still mad at Ethan for that little comment after he went to his podcast well he was one of the first people on that uh, h3 podcast he went to that podcast they filmed him in the most unflattering way he looked like a pear when he was he that was one of the reasons why he started running again he was like he was behind the scenes he's like man i'm kind of fat but that uh that podcast 
somebody wrote in the comments, you know, why'd you have Keem on there? And H3 was just like, yeah, we really don't like him, or but whatever. And when Keem saw that, there you go. That's that's where it started. Three years later, Animini small back and forth through Twitter and jabs against H3 on Drama Alert and H3 hitting back. This eventually, after much confidence, turned into content new Keemstar, a sort of take on the content cop iDubs made. As for what new things it brought to the table in terms of Keemstar's known controversies, practically nothing. But it was effective in the sense that it showcased Keemstar's wrongdoing to new viewers that were not very familiar with Keemstar nor knew about or watched iDubs content cop back in 2016. This sent a massive wave of hate towards Keemstar as his older and new controversies were being fleshed out for a new audience of millions. Expanded by two further videos H3 made on Keem, but the reaction towards H3 video wasn't all positive. Within the over hour long coverage that these videos were spread across, there were bound to be a few mistakes and improperly researched aspects that plague any sort of long form content. In fact, you can look at my comments and you'll probably see a few things that I got wrong with this video, as is typical for these projects. The problem was that H3H3, or Ethan, doesn't make corrections unless he's backed into a corner. And some of the more serious errors was when Ethan failed to provide context in many sections, so we'll talk about the two more prominent ones. First is Smile for YouTube. Ethan talked about how Keemstar gave out Smile for YouTube's wife and his phone numbers and address on livestream, which got them swatted, but failed to mention the harassment that Keemstar also endured from Smile for YouTube's doxings on livestream beyond a single sentence where Ethan says, Keemstar claimed that Smile for YouTube swatted him first. Keemstar claims that Smile for YouTube swatted him first. Smile for YouTube dude is a liar, alright? I never swatted him. He swatted me and he swatted Basher. Another example of failing to paint a fuller picture was when Ethan brought up the swatter Keem interviewed in late 2017. The one he helped get an admission of guilt from and also promoted the GoFundMe for the victim's family. Ethan failed to mention both of these key pieces of information, which then made it seem like he was knowingly leaving out those aspects out to paint Keem poorly for what some considered to be a good deed. Though there is a chance he really didn't know about it, there is still no correction made anywhere in the comments, so it's harder to justify. As for the last big piece that made this content new controversial was Ethan directly attacking G Fuel. Keemstar has got a bottle of G Fuel somewhere in his house that's actually a horcrux. How is G Fuel still sponsored this guy, by the way? G Fuel brought to you by false pedophilia accusations. God, chug it, G Fuel. Get it now. One of, if not Keemstar's biggest sponsor at the time, to the point that his contract with them was terminated, which set a terrifying precedent for many content creator feuds. Maybe in future disagreements, instead of targeting your opposition's actions, you could weaponize your fan base to target their sponsors and therefore their source of revenue. But this tactic could also be used in retaliation, as by the time things settled down, H3 had actually lost more sponsors than Keemstar through the fallout of his nuke. It was mutually assured destruction that many viewers and content creators hold different perspectives on. Oh, and also Keemstar in the past had also done the very same thing, just not to this degree. If G Fuel dropped Keemstar, I would say that's very much Keemstar fault. And another thing you did in this video is an absolute first for YouTube. You went after my sponsors. An absolute first, he says. Isn't that interesting? Well, Keemstar, why don't you just leave the word hypocrite out of your mouth from now on? Fucking hypocrite. You've always been a goddamn hypocrite. <laughs> Many of these teams are big, they have lots of sponsors, and at the same time, they're being racist, homophobic, and trying to convince other children to kill themselves. You went after my sponsors! And they are sponsored by Elgato, Loot Crate, Scuff Controllers, and Cyberpower PC. It's an absolute first for you two. Why are these sponsors sponsoring such a team? You went after my sponsors! There are many small teams out there that do not act this way that I think are more worthy of these sponsorships. But what this whole thing brought to light was a confirmation. A confirmation that Keemstar cannot truly be cancelled because he is in a golden era of controversy that embraces and empowers him. Yes, he can be cancelled if it came out that he was a domestic abuser or predator, but he's not. He is a doxer and hated for many things, but just enough for him to be talked about and energized. So you can't cancel Keemstar for having a 20-year-old girlfriend while he is in his late 30s. 
that interestingly enough, might also be due to him being stuck in his 20s mentally, as the 20 year olds that make up a large portion of YouTube act as his peers, which also largely impact his personality. But back to this golden area of controversy, it's something that we've seen through Jake Paul and Leafius here. It works well for any given content creator as you will always find supporters and objectors constantly talking about these figures and bringing them to light. Embracing it and developing light controversies that have that effect of creating more arguments where the sides are usually split help keep the fire burning. Though it seems now that the newer, more sanitized standards of the internet have fought back against this, as Leafy is now banned and Jake Paul has moved beyond YouTube. Keemstar, however, has avoided major controversies, at least in comparison to the ones he had years prior. This could be partially influenced by YouTube directly reaching out to him about his feud with H3H3. Whatever the case, there has been a pattern of decline in Keem's drama alert channel that can either be blamed on oversaturation or what Keemstar claims to be, YouTube taking more control over the algorithm and slowly killing his channel. Where in the earlier months of 2021, it was rare for one of his videos not to break a million views. Now it's rare for a video to go beyond 600,000 views, and since May of 2021, his channel has been bleeding subscribers. But this came at an opportune time, as Keemstar has said in the past that once he reaches 40, he is retiring from the Drama Alert channel, and so came his announcement to retire on his 40th birthday in March 8, 2022, where he is actively looking for a replacement for his show. So after 13 years on the platform, this finally seems to be the end of Keemstar. The man has seen and lived through several different versions of YouTube, surviving through them with spite and persistence. There are many, if not most people, that hate Keemstar for his previous actions, but equally he also stands as a symbol of success on the platform. An example that you can be cancelled and do questionable things, but with enough work, you can get to where you want to be. You can accept that Keemstar is an infamous figure, but also understand why he still exists. Keemstar is a doxer, manipulative, vindictive, aggressive, spiteful, and will sacrifice anything and everything to get even with someone. But he's also entertaining, focused, and wealthy beyond most YouTubers. Because drama alert for Keemstar, as he claims, is only 5-10% to of his revenue. Keemstar has investments in crypto, pro gaming, celebrity boxing, real estate, and various other lesser known investments like a makeup palette. He also exists in large part outside of YouTube. Yes, there is a fall in views, but there is still a massive rise in wealth. The longer he stays on, the longer his character gains immunity. Keemstar the Clown, the reality TV star of YouTube, is a memorable character that during the making of this video has announced that he will actually not retire from Drama Alert as intended, citing that he is unable to find a replacement and that the value placed on Drama Alert is too low. So even now Keemstar is still staying on YouTube. But one cannot help wonder how different YouTube's timeline would have been if Keemstar had entered YouTube not as himself and not as a troll. But if he was able to fully craft his image with intention as most YouTubers are now. Regardless, Keemstar, the person that he is, and even with his persistence on the platform, would still not have found any success or have a shred of relevancy if there wasn't a demand or a void in aggression and instability on YouTube. A demand for drama that dragged him into the platform back in 2009. Keemstar is that, and so long as that exists, so will Keemstar.